So good morning, everyone. So last week we learned, we looked at serving God. And I thought it would be a good idea for us this week to take a look at why serve God. We're going to start off right off the bat, Isaiah 6, 8, to see what it tells us. Isaiah heard from the Lord. What was the Lord asking? Isaiah 6, 8. Isaiah 6, 8. It says, Then I heard the voice from the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. You know, in a matter of fact, the idea that we should serve the Lord is so obvious in Scripture. I want us to jump over to Luke. Let's go over to Luke. Chapter 8, verse, I mean, chapter 4, verse 8, to see what Jesus quotes. And right here, he's quoting out of Deuteronomy 6.13. Jesus speaking, quoting from Deuteronomy 6.13, Luke 4, 8. It says, Jesus answered them, and it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So as we look at these things, the most pre more pressing question that we should be asking ourselves is why should we want to serve the Lord? Now, if we were to take a poll and ask different Christians why it's important to serve God, we'd probably get a bunch of different answers. Basically because different people are motivated by different things. However, you'll be surprised to know, or even hear, that the scriptures make it very clear that when a person is in a true relationship with the Lord, we're talking, we're talking about true relationship with the Lord, meaning that someone is a follower of Jesus Christ, he will serve God. Do you get that? He will serve God. It's not a question. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Will serve God. See, what, what it comes down to is that we should want to serve God because we know Him. And you know, the essential part of knowing Him is the uh, sincere desire to serve Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for those who are gathered here to glorify you and worship and praise. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, as we go through your word, that you would help us glean from it and to exercise the things that we learn this morning. We thank you for loving us and caring for us and bringing us together. Amen. I know it's something which we talk about in occasion. We read it. We read in our, in our Bibles, but how often do you truly realize that it's always been God's intention to make us to be more and more in the image of His Son, Jesus Christ? With that in mind, I'd like you to move over to Romans 8.29. What is it we read here in Romans 8, 29? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Yes, we read it, but we, do we truly believe it? And the reason why I ask this is because if we truly believe it, wouldn't it be something that we would strive to accomplish within our lives? When you look at Jesus' life, there's no denying that the first and foremost, he was a servant. Jesus' entire life was centered upon serving God by his teaching, by his healing, and by his proclaiming of the, of the kingdom. He even told us straight out, in Matthew 28, 20. And this is a verse that my family and I have taken to heart. 
And we try to express this in every aspect of our lives. Matthew 20, 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, we're told here, he didn't come to be served, but to serve. We're talking about the King of Kings, Lords of Lords. He could have had people serving him down on their knees. But he didn't want that. He came to serve. And you know, we've witnessed so many people that are out there who are serving for the wrong reasons. And do you understand that all they're doing, these people that are do serving for the very wrong reasons, all they're doing is they're doing damage. And I'm not speaking of a little bit of damage. We're speaking of eternity damage here. Yet people continue to justify these people by saying, oh, do you see what a big group they have? Oh, but you don't know. They love it. My response is, what fruit do you see as a result? I'm not asking what fruit they're telling you there is, but what do you observe when you examine thoroughly through God's eyes? What's truly going on? I want to remind you that there are some controversial, and I'm going to say false teachers, that we witness today, that are holding services today in stadiums with thousands of people at a time. And you would think that you were at a concert or some sports event or something. People are raising their hands and doing all kinds of sort of stuff. But what they're not, they're not getting is the gospel. What they're not getting is the gospel. This is the exact reason why I like people to see things with their own eyes. To experience the fruit of God's work through the lives of people. In our ministry, we've always encouraged and supported people to come and see what's going on. When God's moving, you'll certainly see it. And you know, we've been given the most wonderful example. Did you know the night of his arrest, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, leaving them with the final teaching to serve one another. Let's take a look at that in John, the book of John. John 13, verses 12 to 17. And like I said, who is Jesus Christ? Lord of lords, King of kings. So when he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and reclined at the table again. He said to them, Do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for I, so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you, ought to, you, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you, an gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus tells them, and it's also for us to hear, I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done to you. Now, don't be so dense that you're only thinking of washing people's feet. It's much more than this. If Jesus is all about serving and God wants, us to, wants to make us more like Jesus Christ, then it's pretty obvious, obvious that we should be we should all be about serving as well. And you know, we're talking about genuine service. 
genuine service cannot be separated from love. And I believe that we've been here long enough that you see we're not just talking. Because you know there's so many people out there that, that are talking. People that are trying to impress. You know, these kind of things shouldn't, it doesn't impress me and it shouldn't impress you. Our focus should be our walk. Not what we talk. You know, you can pretend, you can fake, you can go through the motions of serving God, but if your heart is not where it should be, you're missing the entire point. This morning, 1 Corinthians 13 was read, and it's, a, it's something I really want us to take a look at and understand. So let's go over to that, 1 Corinthians 13. You know, we're already, we're in our third year. So I'm, I think you have a pretty good grasp of who Grace and I are. You've met our kids. I'm pretty sure you get a grasp of what their, their lives are like. You know, we've always been a family of service. We've served where we've, where we've gone. And nothing's beyond our service. We clean toilets, we clean, you know, sweep and mop and do other things too. We're not saying, oh, yeah, I only do this kind of service. We do everything. Because that's what we're called to do, to serve God. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, If I speak in, with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. If I give all my possession and feed to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So, do we, do we get the aspect that love is important? And what kind of love are we talking about? We're talking about agape love. Unconditional love. Without condition. Men that were at breakfast yesterday, this is what we're talking, we were talking about yesterday. This is the kind of love that you should have for your spouse. This unconditional love. And in verse 4 it continues, Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecoming. It does not seek his own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account the wrong suffering. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth, bearing all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. When you are a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are faking love, or you don't have this agape love, the things we mention here, there's some people you might know. You look at them. Do they have these qualities in their lives? Do they have these qualities? If they do not, then they don't, don't know love. And if you don't know love, you don't know, you don't know God. It continues in verse 8. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesied in part, but when the perf uh, perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I came, became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. See, here it makes it really clear that unless you serve I'm sorry, unless your service is fully rooted in love, it's meaningless. And what kind of love are we speaking about? 
We're not talking about emotional love. We're talking about unconditional agape love. If your service is not rooted in this agape love, it's all meaningless. Serving God out of a sense of obligation or duty, apart from God's love, is not what he desires. Rather, serving God should be our natural love-filled response to him who loved us first. What are we told in 1 John 4? 1 John 4, 9-11. Let's take a look at what that tells us. First John 4, 9-11. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has spent his, I'm sorry, God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Now, the question comes, why do we love? And we're told in verse 19, we love because he loved us first. Grasp that. We love because he loved us first. If a person is, person is serving from this possession of love, what would that look like? It becomes their passion. Not for the praise of men, but for the desire to serve God through serving others. Now understand this where we come to in verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, then he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now let me ask, is this something which we can be, the, something that which can be witnessed by others? Can, if I didn't love my brother or sister in Christ, would you be able to see that in me? Yes. Even if I fake it, you should be able to see that. It's called discernment, right? We've all been given that. And when we're talking with the kids, the thing is, the problem is we need to practice these things. We need to practice them so we get better at them, right? Because he loved us first. Now, all these things which we've spoken about in 1 Corinthians 13, these are things that come down to your Christian walk. If you open your eyes and really take a look and start seeing the cracks in the lives of these pretenders who are not truly serving the Lord, you can see a lot of things. Now, the Apostle Paul is a great example of how having a relationship with God through Christ results in service. Prior to his conversion, Paul persecuted and killed believers. Now, do you think for one moment that he believed that he was truly serving God through his actions? Yes, of course. He thought he was. But after he counted Jesus on the road to Damascus, what happened? He immediately devoted the rest of his life to truly serving God by spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. And it's such an amazing story. And you know, I bet if you were to talk with Paul, he would say humbly, I'm just a guy that God used for his purpose. You know, isn't this, isn't this something that each and every one of us should want to confess? Should want to be able to confess. 
that I'm just a person that God used for his purpose. Let's take a look at 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 14. And you think about Paul. And he, here in this, we're going to read, he describes his transformation, right? But see, who was Paul? Paul had it made. He was a Pharisee. He was doing the world's bidding, right? He would have been one of the top Pharisees. He would have lived very well. But he gave that all up for pain, right? How many times was he, was he beaten? How many times was he shipwrecked? How many times was he, was he in prison? You know, think of all the things he could have had, but he threw it all away for, to serve the Lord. What was important to him? And why was it important? 1 Timothy 12, uh, 1, 12 to 14. I thank Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me to service. I mean, just, just look at this. All the things he's gone through, and he's, he's humbly saying, you know, God, uh, he strengthened me. He even considered me faithful by putting me to service. Verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorant, ignorantly in unbelief. So he acknowledges what he thought was doing God's bidding wasn't. Verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Jesus, or Christ Jesus. See, Paul's telling us that once he became aware of the love and grace of God, that he, what God's given him, what was his response? To serve God. To serve God. Like, what can you say to that? Do you wish you could be like that? Well, why can't you? You know, we're not all called to preach and teach, but there's so many other things we can be involved with. And you know, it all leads up to our spiritual growth. In our Wednesday Bible studies, we're going over 1 Corinthians, we're in chapter 3, and we've gotten through, it, through verses 1 to 3. This is where, where Paul's telling them, I can't speak to you like spiritual men, but as fleshly men. And he continues that he needs to speak to them as infants in Christ. And why after being taught by Paul for 18 months, and a teacher like Apollos for a time, a period of time, did he have to speak to them in this, in this fashion? It's because they didn't, they didn't take responsibility for their growth. They were lazy. They came into the knowledge of Christ receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that was it. Because they were bound to the world and to the flesh. Folks, is this where we want to be? Did you know that the Bible offers several motivations for our service? We want to serve God because, Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we receive the kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence, reverence and awe. By serving God, you're showing gratitude to Him. And it also tells us that we should do it, acceptable service in reverence and awe. You know what that means? See, you've received something. What has God given you? You've been reborn. You have a new life. The old stuff that we lived before is gone. Now we have something new. God's chosen you to be his child. You are a child of, of God. Shouldn't you be grateful for that? Yeah. 
If you've been regenerate, where are you now in your life then? Do you have a sense of gratitude? If you do, where should that lead us? Now, we want to serve God because our service supplies the needs of the Lord, Lord's people. In 2 Corinthians 9, 12, right? When we serve, when we serve God, we're serving others, right? We are serving others. Second, uh, Second Corinthians nine twelve. For the ministry of the service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also over overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. See, when you're serving others, when you're serving God, you're serving others. When you're serving others, you're giving thanksgiving to God. So it goes, it goes right back to God. Now next, we want to serve God because our service proves our faith and causes others to praise God. 2 Corinthians 9.13 Because of the proof given by this ministry, then we'll glorify God for your obedience to your confession to the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. See, this is what we were speaking about earlier. Serving is pointing yourself. It's, it's not pointing to yourself. It's pointing to God. And others want that. Each of these are a good reason to serve God. Now, review, to review for understanding, you can only give away what you first received. The reason why we can love and serve God is because He loved us first and served us through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the more we're aware of and experience God's love in our lives, the more likely we're, we're, we are to uh, respond to His love by serving Him. If you want to serve God, the key to that is getting to know Him. So what do we do, you ask? What we need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to reveal uh, more of God to you. Just as we're told in John 16, 13. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will disclose to you what is to come. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, if you have received the Holy Spirit, and this is a one-time life event, now the Spirit allows you to live a life of obedience to God. And He is able to give you the power and the strength that you need to serve Him here in this fallen world. So how do we do that? We do that by letting Him take the lead in our lives so that we will be empowered to do the work of God. The work that He has given us to do to live humble obedient in obedience, humbly in obedience, leading to the guidance, guidance of the Spirit. How do we do that? We're told in Galatians 5. See, the Bible has all the answers. We spoke about last week that you know, with, I think with the kids last week, the BLBLE, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. This is our instruction booklet. If you don't know this, you're lost. I remember, I mean, I, was, I wasn't saved until I was 25. I, never, I was raised Catholic. I didn't have a Bible. I never opened a Bible. I've seen a Bible like this. I've never seen it like this. Right? Once you get to know what's inside, your life totally changes. 
Because you know where God's leading you. You know where he wants you to go. All the answers are there. Galatians 5, 16 to 26. It says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the, the, for the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. All right, get that. Spirit, the Spirit and the flesh, they're opposites. Some people try to live with one foot in the world and one foot in church. That doesn't work. These are complete opposites. They oppose each other. You can't live one foot here and one foot there. You're either fully in the world, like we're talking about in 1 Corinthians. Either you're in full in the world or you're fully for Christ. You can't be both. That's what the, the problem the Corinthians had. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, en enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, fractions, factions, envying, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this, which are, I forewarn you, forewarn you. Just I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this is not a complete list. This is a list of some things to give you an idea. And those who follow these things, basically the things of the world, the things of the flesh, which we went over Wednesday, they pretty much coincide with one another. They look, they look similar. Will not inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Such things, there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Okay, this list of things here. Love, where does love come from? It comes from God. Joy, where does joy come from? Joy comes from God. Peace, where does peace come, come from? It comes from knowing God. Kindness, again from knowing God. Goodness and faithfulness from knowing God. Self-control. See, some of these things are, are learnt. Things that we have to learn and practice and get better at. Self-control. Sometimes some of us, doesn't matter how old you are, don't have self-control. Right? Because you don't, don't practice it. It needs to be practiced and learned and practiced. If you don't practice it, you know, you're not going to be any good at, at self-control. It needs to be practiced. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying, envying one another. So if we're going to live by the Spirit, let us also, not just talk in the Spirit, right? And that bothers me when people, people I see people, they, they think they live in the Spirit, and they talk in the Spirit, right? They say all these holy things. Oh, praise God, and praise this, and praise that, and, you know, Lord this, and Lord that. But when you look at their walk, it's pitiful. Right? It says, live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Not talk. We need to walk in the Spirit. Can the worship team come up, please? All right, so what does all this mean? It means that if you're going to let the Spirit work through you, you need to start with the renewing of your mind, which is an act of repentance. You need to let the things of the world and the things of the flesh, let go, let go of those things. As we're told that these things are incompatible, un that they're in opposition with one another, things of the flesh and the world against the Spirit. In other words, like I said earlier, you can't have one foot in the world and one foot with God. Choices need to be made. 
You either choose God or you choose the world. And you know, when you truly know God, God who is love, our natural response and desire is to love and serve Him in return. What are we told in 1 John 4, 8? The one who does not love or know God, for, sorry, for the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So where are you in your spiritual life this morning? As you take a good look and reflect, and we're not speaking about what other people see in you, but looking right at yourself with the eyes of God. Do you understand why, the why of serving God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, to lead us and guide us by the Spirit in our lives. Allow us to, to allow you to work through us, Heavenly Father, to glorify you with every aspect of our lives. Help us grow spiritually in you that we can glorify you and make you known to others. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this morning. We just ask that you continue to bless us during this week. Amen. Please stand and join us for the...